Okay, seems like we have quite a lot of people. So hello again, this is Humayun. Uh, thank you all for joining. It's great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Steve Fusler from the Southwest Research Institute, University of Texas. Um, Steve studied physics at the University of Southern California. He then received a PhD in physics from the University of Iowa in 1984. Uh, Steve was among the first to investigate ion kinetic processes in magnetic peak connection. He has contributed important works on magnetic peak connection at Earth's magnetopause that led to significant advances in the understanding of kinetic processes in reconnection. Steve found a novel remote sensing technique to estimate the location of magnetic reconnection X lines at the day side magnetopause. This was crucial for the design of NASA's LMS orbit configurations to maximize the spacecraft encounters with the reconnection X line region. Steve is also the lead investigator for hot plasma composition analyzer on MMS that allow measurement of heavy ions at the dayside magnetosphere. Steve has received many awards, including the prestigious Hannes Alvin Medal in 2016 for his fundamental contribution to understanding the physics of the interaction of the solar wind with Earth's magnetosphere, comets, and the interstellar medium. Currently, he's an executive director at Southwest Research Institute, University of Texas, and today he will discuss oxygen at the dayside magnetopause and outer magnetosphere. Before he begins, I would like to remind you all that this presentation is recorded. Please keep your microphones muted. Um, if you have questions, then please send them to me through private chat or post them in the group chat, and I will try to ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, also, Please make sure your questions are concise and make sure your name is included if it's not clear from your username. So before I say anything more, Steve, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, seminar series. Uh, I, I think it's uh, one of the uh, bright spots in the COVID-19 crisis that we're facing that uh, that we have the opportunity to uh, present seminars uh, and listen to seminars uh, uh, through this uh, through this venue. Uh, I've enjoyed the seminars uh, re in recent weeks. Uh, they've been very good, and I hope that uh, you find this one uh, also interesting. Uh, I, I have some special thanks down there uh, to the EC Cold Plasma team. Uh, I'm on that. Uh, Sergio Toledo Redondo is, uh, is the leader of that. Uh, oxygen at the dayside magnetopause, uh, some of it, a large fraction of it, in fact, is cold. And so it falls under the purview of our study, our study team. Mick Denton is at uh, uh, Los Alamos, and he, him and I have been working uh, together. And also the MMS HPCA team, uh, of which I'm the leader, but but by far not, uh, it's a team, team effort. And uh, uh, we, we do quite a lot of uh, work together as a team. Uh, so my, my agenda for this talk, uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the discovery of oxygen in the magnetosphere, uh, because uh, a lot of you on, the, uh, on this call here are not uh, fully aware of, uh, of of when it was discovered and how it was discovered, and so I thought it was an interesting uh, uh, bit of history, uh, if you'd like. Uh, and then uh, the sources and populations, uh, the, in particular the high latitude ionosphere, uh, and the populations, the two populations I want to focus on on the day side, uh, that's the ring current and what's called the warm plasma cloak, which I'll Define in, in, a, in a little bit here. Um, uh, the transport to the dayside magnetopause uh, uh, and through convection, uh, and then uh, the sinks on the dayside, in particular, I'm going to focus on the dayside magnetic reconnection, uh, which opens up field lines on at the dayside magnetopause. 
and, and then I'm going to uh, take uh, discuss a special case, uh, not so special, but the special case of Northward IMF. So the talk uh, up to that point of the special case is going to be focused on, uh, if you'd like, sustained southward IMF. Uh, you know, the IMF moves around quite a lot, uh, and and uh, what I'd like uh, to do to do is simplify things and discuss uh, the dayside magnetopause under sustained southward IMF. And I'm going to use a, a, a single particular event to, uh, to emphasize some of these features that I'm going to talk about. And then uh, conclusion questions and future work. Uh, the discovery of oxygen. Uh, so uh, there were observations from a polar orbiting satellite, uh, 800 kilometer near sun synchronous orbit. Uh, and uh, my, I was actually uh, my boss at uh, Lockheed Martin, when I was at Lockheed Martin, Ed Shelley, that built a, a, a swept uh, vein filter, velocity filter, uh, mass spectrometer, followed, uh, followed by an ESA and a, and a channel electron multiplier. Uh, so they measured uh, uh, ion composition from 0.7 or 700 EV to 12 kilovolts. And they made these measurements during a geomagnetic storm in 1971. And what you're seeing on the right hand side is the discovery of this, uh, of oxygen uh, in, the, in the magnetosphere. So the oxygen was coming up the field line uh, and uh, clearly had enough energy to get out into the, uh, into the magnetosphere. Uh, and, uh, and so therefore was escaping. And uh, it was quite a surprise, the oxygen uh, uh, there at, um, at, uh, at uh, mass per charge 16. Uh, uh, and then you can see the hydrogen here at, uh, at mass per charge 1. And, uh, and it was published in a paper in 1972, uh, Shelley, Shar Johnson, and Sharp. That was a group of three scientists at uh, Lockheed uh, Ed Shelley was the instrument builder. Dick Johnson was the uh, the money man, and uh, and Dick Sharp was the uh, was the scientist uh, of the group. That's kind of how they divided up their uh, their work. Um, it, uh, they they flew uh, a similar mass spectrometer uh, earlier on an earlier mission, uh, but the uh, but the it only went up to mass per charge eight, which is this green line here. And, uh, and why did it only go up to mass per charge eight? Well, they were uh, basically told by the community that uh, uh, why would you want to fly a mass spectrometer? All you're going to see is uh, hydrogen and helium double plus from the solar wind. And what they did see though was an, uh, an increase in the count rate uh, at the end of their mass uh, range. And so uh, they had the opportunity to build and fly uh, 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 another mass spectrometer where they increased the mass range and uh, they increased it in fact to 32 and uh, they, could, they could see uh, oxygen. Of course, you know, mass resolution is pretty, uh, pretty poor, but, uh, but it was later shown that this was, this was really oxygen. So uh, oxygen in the dayside magnetosphere, the sources, uh, the high latitude ionosphere is the source of all, uh, um, if you'd like, uh, of the oxygen observed in the dayside magnetosphere. Uh, it's always, it, it has been uh, and continues to be a question of which part of the high latitude ionosphere uh, is providing the oxygen the potential sources, the cusp, uh, the, or, the whole auroral oval, the nightside auroral oval, the pol polar cap, all of those are potential sources. And uh, it's pretty clear that the dominant sources depend on the magnetospheric convection. And, and uh, that convection depends on the strength and orientation of the interplanetary magnetic field. What I show here from a, from a paper from 2017 uh, is an example of this convection out of the high latitude ionosphere uh, for southward IMF. And as I said, I'm going to be focusing on southward IMF uh, throughout this talk, except at the very end. And you can see uh, what's called the geomagnetic mass spectrometer. Uh, 
uh, ions that come out of the ionos uh, the high latitude ionosphere uh, from one of these potential sources uh, because of convection at a field of the reconnected field lines. These ions uh, propagate tailward and they go into the tail and where they go into the tail uh, depends on their energy but also their mass. So the oxygen tends to fall in the tail or uh, closer to the earth than the hydrogen. Uh, and uh, and this, is, this has been a, a debate, as I said, uh, and continues to be a debate of which source is dominant source. Uh, and uh, when you look in the day side, uh, uh, there are two basic populations. There's a ring current uh, oxygen, which is hot, and the warm plasma cloak, which is cold. Uh, warm plasma cloak was so named in 2008 uh, uh, as a distinct population from the ring current. Uh, composition, energy distinguish these two populations. The ring current is a, has a substantial solar wind source uh, in it, in addition to an ionospheric source, whereas the warm plasma cloak uh, is uh, essentially a pure ionospheric source. Uh, You'll see examples of this in just a minute. Um, but I throw out this as a, a question. If the overall composition is different, does that mean that the ionospheric components come from a different source locations? And the answer to this is not necessarily a yes or no. Uh, it's, it's not clear. Or is the energization uh, convection history of the two populations different? Or is it a mixture of both? And all of those uh, are, are essentially questions that uh, uh, try to understand the, the, the distinction of these two uh, populations, why they are distinct. So here's an example of the ring current and the warm plasma cloak in the magnetosphere. It's 10 minutes of data from MMS-1, uh, the HPCA instrument, uh, 21 December. And uh, what's plotted from uh, top to bottom uh, here is the hydrogen uh, uh, energy time spectrogram, the helium double plus energy time spectrogram, the helium plus energy time spectrogram, and the oxygen energy time spectrogram. And then on the bottom here are the hydrogen and oxygen densities. And uh, you can see first at the bottom that the oxygen density here in the magnetosphere uh, is not quite as high, but certainly you could argue rivals the, uh, the hydrogen density. Uh, the, uh, this is after a geomagnetic storm, and, uh, and uh, the spacecraft was uh, at, the noon, at the noon meridian, essentially, uh, at a distance of sort of between 8.5 8 and 9.3 RE. Uh, it just crossed the magnetopause a, a little while uh, earlier. It's on inbound uh, trajectory. And um, you can see that uh, barely that, uh, that the hydrogen here, uh, the higher energy population above a kilovolt or so, uh, that's the ring current. Uh, but you can see down here uh, at times a distinct second population. That's the warm plasma cloak. Uh, down here at energies of, of the order of 10 EV. Uh, you see none of that warm plasma cloak in the helium double plus, but you see a, a substantial ring current population of, of helium double plus. Uh, the helium plus is, is kind of a mixture. Uh, it's fairly low density, uh, low flux, uh, but you can clearly see that there is a, a ring current uh, contribution from helium plus. And then uh, on occasion, there are uh, uh, low counts, but, but uh, at lower energy of the warm plasma cloak helium plus. And then finally, the oxygen, uh, barely discernible here. Uh, you see the ring current, and then you see uh, the, uh, the warm plasma cloak sticking down here in, in energy. And I put this little note down here in the bottom, uh, uh, a color spectrogram physics. Uh, uh, there's a lot to be interpreted from color spectrograms, but uh, you um, really need to take a look at distribution functions uh, to, to truly understand what you're, what you're looking at here. Uh, and here, here are two distribution functions, uh, hydrogen and, and oxygen, from, the, uh, from that time period. 
uh, and, uh, and they show the difference uh, between the uh, temperature and speed of a plasma. Uh, so I've zoomed in. Uh, I, I don't show the full energy range uh, or full velocity range of, uh, of HPCA here. Uh, and uh, you're looking at a 2D pitch angle distribution function. So I've, I've folded the pitch angle, uh, I've folded the, the distribution about the magnetic field in the rest frame of the uh, hydrogen uh, flow velocity. And so you can see, uh, you can see the warm plasma cloak consists of uh, counter streaming oxygen, counter streaming hydrogen. They're not necessarily at the same flux uh, level. Uh, the, the flux is going parallel to the field or slightly higher. Uh, uh, but, but basically the oxygen and the hydrogen is, are streaming along the field at the same velocity. Uh, and their temperature is, is the temperature kind of related to here uh, first, T perp is greater than T parallel, uh, but uh, but the te their temperature of this of this cold component is relatively low, uh, but um, but because they're moving along at the same velocity, a uh, hundred kilometers per second, that is out here, uh, parallel to B, uh, is uh, only fifty eV for hydrogen, whereas it's uh, almost a kilovolt for oxygen. And so you can see that uh, in the previous panel, when I talked about the warm plasma cloak uh, being kind of mixed in with the oxygen, it's because the uh, warm plasma cloak oxygen is, uh, is propagating along the field at the same velocity as the hydrogen. And so uh, you can see though, at least for oxygen, there's no real energy distinction whereas uh, between the warm plasma cloak and the ring current, whereas for hydrogen, you can see this population out here uh, at, the, at the highest velocities, that's, that's the ring current. Uh, so, and this is typical of the oxygen uh, in the warm plasma cloak uh, is, is uh, it's cold, it's uh, propagating with the hydrogen and it's usually counter streaming along the field. So I'm, Definitely sidestepping an issue here, uh, and that issue is uh, is what is the ultimate source of the ring current in the warm plasma cloak? As I said, there's a whole variety of different possible sources, and I'm just basically avoiding that uh, that discussion. For southward IMF, uh, both populations, the ring current in the warm plasma cloak, or what is going to be the ring current in the warm plasma cloak, both go into the tail. Uh, and so that much we do know. And, uh, and we also know that it is a competition uh, between the cusp and the night side or oral oval. And I you know, would recommend uh, you take a look at some of the recent papers by Lynn Kistler and associates, uh, especially the ones uh, where they use Rossi and MMS in a, in a combined effort to look at this convection of, 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 of the cusp and the night side or oral oval contributions. It's quite definitive work, very nice, nice work, but I'm basically avoiding it. Uh, for the purposes here, uh, just assume that the oxygen enters the night side uh, for southward IMF. Uh, and the, as we're going to talk about the special case in just a minute here. Uh, so how does it get to the day side if it's in the night side? And the answer to that, of course, is convection. And I've drawn on the right-hand side here uh, a very simple model of, of ion, ion drift paths uh, in the magnetosphere, uh, again, for southward IMF. Uh, you get injection from plasma from the tail, the plasma will drift. It, uh, it goes dawnward uh, uh, for low energy plasma and dustward for high energy plasma. Uh, technically, it should not cross this uh, solid line, the, the alphane layer, uh, and the plasma should go right up basically to the plasma pause and then drift around it. Uh, and you can see this, uh, this effect of the plasma basically stopping and, and, make, and turning uh, to drift around the plasma pause when you look at uh, uh, energetic neutral atom observations uh, that reveal this, this drift. Path. So if this is a 5 to 12 kilovolt ion fluxes derived from the ENAs uh, observed during a moderate storm. 
and you can see that uh, the pileup, if you'd like, of the oxygen, uh, of the, sorry, of the ions, uh, there's not, it's not oxygen, but uh, the pileup of the ions uh, in on the night side as the, as the plasma drifts from the, from the day side and basically uh, uh, starts its convection around. Um, you can also see this on the day side, uh, and uh, this is a, a very nice study uh, of uh, using the LANL uh, MPA instruments that are in geosynchronous orbits and, uh, and the Van Allen probe HOPE uh, observations. So the ion composition is different when you look at the plasmospheric plume, which I'm not going to be discussing. In this talk, uh, it has hydrogen and helium plus in it mainly, and the helium plus is greater than the oxygen. Whereas the ring current and the warm plasma cloak, they drift, uh, they have oxygen, hydrogen, and helium plus, but oxygen is higher, uh, and helium double plus, and they convect around, at least uh, when you look at this, uh, this picture out to geosynchronous orbit, they convect around, these ions convect around uh, and basically make a make a 90 degree turn if you'd like uh, uh, following the uh, plasmaspheric plume uh, out to the day side. So just as a, a simple uh, convection path that I just showed you. Um, we can see this effect uh, uh, at the day side magnetopause. Uh, um, uh, so you know, the question is, is, is the convection to, into the outer magnetosphere, is it the same? Uh, that's that's a, a debatable question. But, uh, but we did a survey of uh, just simply said uh, warm plasma cloak within one and a half hours of a magnetopause crossing. And, uh, and you, uh, you can see that the warm plasma cloak, uh, this is, these are the MMS orbits for a an entire day side pass when, when the spacecraft was at uh, apogee of 12 RE. And you can see the, that uh, the warm plasma cloak tends to appear on the dust side. Now, you know, there's little evidence of this alphane layer. Remember I said that the, that the uh, warm plasma cloak uh, shouldn't cross that alphane layer. But this, is, this plot here is not the same as tracing the ion convection from the tail to the day side. So, uh, but but it, it remains an interesting question, what does the convection look like in the outer magnetosphere? In particular, what's, what's the convection pattern of this warm plasma cloak? All right, you've got it on the day side. Uh, what happens to it? And, uh, and this is where we get into the sinks of magnetospheric oxygen. Uh, uh, on, on, in the day side magnetosphere. Uh, one, one important sink is, uh, is charge exchange, and I'm basically ignoring it here. Uh, uh, it's an important sink, though, for oxygen convecting from the night side. And there was a very uh, nice, but quite early study, again, by Lynn Kistler et al. Uh, in 1989, uh, talking about um, uh, charge exchange and, and, uh, and the lifetime as a function of energy of oxygen in the magnetosphere. And uh, although, although it wasn't named yet, uh, uh, this study actually covered both the, uh, the warm plasma cloak energies uh, down to a few kilovolts all the way up to and, uh, and through the, uh, the ring current energies. And uh, so, uh, I recommend if you you know if you want want to look at charge exchange and understand it as a sink, uh, uh, that's the place to start. Really, uh, the ionosphere uh, is certainly a sink. Uh, the oxygen, as I, I showed you, uh, is moving along the field line. Uh, some of it certainly will go into the ionosphere, and. Uh, I, you know, just as a little teaser here, uh, I, I, we have an interesting new development from our rocket experiment in the cusp that we flew. Uh, it, was Trice two, it was called TRICE-2. It was launched in December 2018. And my graduate student, Ryan Sawyer, had a, had a talk at AGU about this, and he's working on a paper. Uh, and it basically illustrates that 
the ionosphere can also be a sink for uh, for uh, this um, uh, magnetospheric oxygen on the day side. So uh, it comes out of the ionosphere and it can end up back in the uh, high latitude ionosphere as well. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, the one that I want to focus most on is magnetic reconnection at the day side magnetopause. So uh, before I uh, get into uh, magnetic reconnection as a, uh, or the open magnetopause as a sink for oxygen in the day side, uh, I want to share uh, with you uh, my view of magnetic reconnection for southward IMF. It's not exclusive, it is shared by others. Uh, uh, it's always occurring somewhere on the magnetopause. Uh, it's for southward IMF, there are long uh, reconnection lines or lines across the entire day side magnetopause. Uh, uh, the, the illustration you have on the right hand side is again for this date, 21 December, the IMF orientation. Uh, uh, because of the IMF orientation, it produces a neutral line that this is a terminator here, runs from past the terminator along this ridge of high shear, uh, 180 degrees shear. Uh, the neutral line cuts across, or the X line cuts across the day side, across the, the uh, noon uh, meridian, uh, connects with this, uh, this other shear, uh, other uh, ridge of, of high shear. And uh, in this particular case, as I said, MMS is virtually at the subsolar point uh, making these observations. And so this is, this is what, what the reconnection line looks like for, um, uh, for uh, southward IMF where uh, the IMF orientation where BY and BZ are, are roughly the same. Uh, and so basically that reconnection line, X line uh, opens the magnetopause everywhere all the time uh, for southward IMF. And so uh, if O plus convex to the magnetopause, then it will be affected by reconnection. Uh, the reverse could happen. O plus could affect reconnection. That is not, uh, uh, that's not the purview of this talk right here, but, uh, but uh, it will certainly be affected by reconnection uh, if, if, if there is a reconnection across the entire day side, magnetopause. Uh, so what happens uh, to, what, what, is, what does reconnection do to the plasma at the magnetopause? Uh, this is an illustration from a paper by Jack Gosling et al, a 1990 paper. It's actually on the cover of GRL when they used to have printed covers. Uh, the ions are uh, either transmit through or reflect off the magnetopause. And uh, this is a, a very nice, uh, concise illustration. Uh, of uh, a reconnection line and uh, the reconnection uh, diffusion region is down here at the, at the intersection of these S1 and S2, which are the separatrices. Uh, and you can see the magnetospheric, magnetosheath particles uh, uh, either go uh, back into the magnetosheath or are transmitted across the magnetopause. And likewise, uh, the magnetospheric particles, ring current, uh, and uh, the ionosphere, uh, uh, they, are, they are also either reflected off the magnetopause and stay into the magnetosphere, but along these reconnected field lines, or cross uh, and go out into the magnetosheath. Uh, uh, since, since this picture has been drawn, uh, we uh, have some understanding, uh, 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 as best as we can tell, that the reflection coefficient is approximately 50%. And uh, it just so happens that if you look at these drawings here, uh, uh, the, this paper uh, in 1990 basically illustrates a a reflection coefficient of about 50%. They didn't know it at the time, but it's actually uh, uh, a pretty good illustration uh, of, of what we know about it. Uh, also, uh, despite some earlier papers by myself, uh, uh, it appears to be independent of mass. 
And uh, that's an important thing and a new result uh, also from one of my graduate students. Um, and, uh, and so, so uh, as much oxygen reflects off the magnetopause as does uh, hydrogen and as much, uh, much helium two plus is transmitted into the magnetosphere uh, as, as is hydrogen from the, uh, from the uh, magneto sheet. So what does this look like in observations? Well, uh, again, this is this example here uh, uh, that I picked out of 21 December. It's after a, one of the larger geomagnetic storms in 2015. Uh, the solar wind density a day earlier was 50 per cubic centimeter, which is, uh, which is uh, huge. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is basically the recovery of uh, a, a, a fairly large storm. Uh, there are very high oxygen densities in the, in the magnetosphere here, uh, which, um, which actually uh, this, this particular plot at, in this particular time interval of uh, of twenty minutes, you you actually don't get into the magnetosphere. Uh, you you uh, go from the magneto sheath into uh, the magneto sheath boundary layer, the boundary layer on the magneto sheath side of the magnetopause, and then into the low latitude boundary layer, which is the boundary layer on the magnetospheric side of the magnetopause. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, that. Uh, as you're in the magneto sheath, there's uh, there's no oxygen, uh, O plus. That's a magnetospheric uh, uh, ion. Uh, whereas you can see the uh, magneto sheath hydrogen here. Uh, but you can also see that as you approach the magnetopause, you get into a region where uh, you see uh, high energy oxygen, which looks just like the energy oxygen from inside the magnetosphere. Uh, and the energy basically increases as you as you go out here. This is the magneto sheath boundary layer, and these are ions that are escaping out all across the uh, open magnetopause, and you can see their densities uh, falling off with distance from the magnetopause. Likewise, you can see uh, the high energy uh, hydrogen ring current, primarily ring current uh, population here, uh, also escaping uh, in into the, uh, into the uh, magneto sheath along these open field lines. Uh, finally, this, this panel at the bottom here is the velocity. And I put it in here just to point out that, uh, that, the, there, that there are accelerated flow velocity flows in, in the low latitude boundary layer. This is what uh, people typically use to uh, identify reconnection. Uh, some go even further than that and test and see if this uh, matches the uh, Villain relation. Uh, and I'll have something to say about that in just a second. But you can see clearly that there are accelerated flows here uh, and they're going southward. Uh, the, red, the red is, is VZ and, uh, and they're going southward. And I remind you backing up here about this picture of where the spacecraft was relative to the X-line. The spacecraft was, uh, <clears throat> was uh, south of the reconnection line. So uh, reconnected field lines are injecting plasma down into the, into the southern cusp. And so uh, you expect to see uh, uh, accelerated flows going, uh, going with VZ uh, negative. And, um, so, uh, but we can, we can take this a, a step further by actually looking at the distribution functions uh, in, in, uh, in, in the uh, various boundary layers here. Uh, so um, there's a picture again, uh, the spacecraft is south of the reconnection line. And so you can make specific predictions from reconnection. In the low latitude boundary layer, you expect to see a, uh, a population of magneto sheath ions entering uh, into, the, into the low latitude boundary layer, and they're gonna have a cutoff velocity. And this is what's typically called the D-shaped distribution uh, in, in, uh, in the low latitude boundary layer. That's just simply the entering magneto sheath ions and you're seeing the cutoff velocity. Uh, there's going to be another population though here at zero velocity uh, in, in this 
in this uh, frame of reference where the perpendicular velocity is zero. And those are the magnetospheric uh, ions, in that case, uh, uh, protons, you'll see. And then when you get out into the magnetosheath boundary layer, the magnetic field is southward and, and, and uh, pointed downward. You're going to see the incident, uh, the, the magnetosheath ions that are approaching the magnetopause, and you're going to see the magnetosheath ions that are reflected off the magnetopause. And they will also have a cutoff uh, velocity, um, what kind of merges into, uh, into this uh, incident population. So what does this look like uh, in the distribution functions? So this is the observed distribution function uh, for hydrogen and for oxygen in the magnetosheath boundary layer. Remember, here's the prediction. Uh, magnetosheath ions approaching the magnetopause, right there, the ones that are reflected. And you can actually see a population out here that's not a background. That is uh, the transmitted ring current population that's flowing along the reconnected field line. Uh, and then uh, you can see very nicely uh, uh, an extreme example of, uh, of an oxygen beam uh, that is coming out, of, coming out along the reconnected field line. And the velocity of this beam and the velocity of this reflected population are the same. They have to be uh, by sort of by definition. Uh, and, so, and so you can see uh, that uh, you can see that quite a nice reflected uh, uh, or transmitted uh, oxygen beam. When you go into the low latitude boundary layer, the hydrogen here, you can see the population that is uh, propagating anti-parallel to the field. That's the, the transmitted hydrogen. And you can also see a, a fairly dense population of, of uh, magnetospheric uh, ions. The oxygen is a little bit more evident. You see, uh, you see exactly what you see outside for the magnetosheath population. You see inside uh, for the magnetospheric population. You see the incident oxygen on to the magnetopause and you see the uh, reflected population that is. And again, this velocity, the reflected and the transmitted uh, hydrogen, they're moving at the same velocity. Now, uh, this population is pretty obvious. It's gone. It's in the magnetosphere or a magnetosheath. It's along a reconnected field line, and unless you reconnect that field line again, that that percent, that population of oxygen, fifty percent of it, uh, is is going to basically leave the system, uh, never to come back to the uh, to the magnetosphere again. This population here is propagating towards the southern cusp, but it's also propagating towards the southern cusp with this kind of energy. It's, it has the same energy as the hydrogen. And so more than likely, because of its velocity, it's going to go down to the ionosphere, uh, reflect, and basically, because it's southward IMF, go tailward. And, uh, and more than likely, uh, it's going to be expelled out of the tail and never, again, never to come back. And so you can see that uh, with this basics here, that, uh, that the oxygen that gets entrained in the reconnection on the day side magnetopause basically leaves the system. Half of it directly out of the magnetosheath and the other half uh, goes through the cusp and basically the tail. So uh, that's all southward IMF, special case for northward IMF. Uh, northward IMF, uh, again, talking about sustained, in this case, 10 to 20 minutes of easy north. Uh, if you have that, and for northward IMF, you get reconnection poleward at a cusp and poleward of both cusps uh, and that create closed field lines on the day side. Uh, and so the oxygen that's coming out of the ionosphere uh, in the cusps, uh, northern and southern cusps, they are, uh, the, instead of going tailward, like they would uh, for southward IMF, this field line gets pinched off, and so they actually go sunward, and they produce a counter-streaming oxygen population in the dayside low-latitude boundary layer. Uh, be, and it's a fairly high energy because this, this field line is snapping this way, this field line is snapping this way through the reconnection, 
And so it accelerates the oxygen on there to, to, uh, tens, to 10 kilovolts, up to 10 kilovolts. And so what you have uh, for northward IMF is a closed field line filled with, the ion, with ionospheric and solar wind plasma. And that field line is going to slowly convect tailward uh, uh, in, in because, because the, the, the convection velocity is not zero in the low, in the low latitude boundary layer, it's going to slowly convect tailward. Uh, what does this look like in observations? Uh, this is a crossing. Uh, actually, it's an instance when, uh, when, the, when the spacecraft crossed into the low latitude boundary layer and somewhere around here, uh, the IMF rotated from northward to southward. So as the spacecraft was approaching the magnetopause, uh, you see a, a, a decrease in the magneto sheath uh, hydrogen. This is, and you see an increase in the magneto sheath uh, magnetic field. And you see all these fluctuations down here. Those are mirror mode waves which stop uh, before you get to the magnetopause. This is the classic uh, uh, signatures of a plasma depletion layer uh, prior to the first magnetopause encounter, which is right here. You encounter a magnetopause uh, uh, several times here, um, and you can see the oxygen, very high density. This is uh, some of the highest density oxygen I've ever seen, uh, above one per cubic centimeter. It, it, it exceeds at, at one point. Uh, the oxygen here, but basically is counter streaming uh, and is, uh, is essentially trapped on these field lines uh, 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 that were created by the reconnection, the high latitude reconnection. And then uh, uh, near the end of this picture here, this, this next magnetopause crossing, that you can see the BZ component of magnetic field turn southward and, uh, and you again, see this oxygen coming out of the magnetosphere uh, into the magnetosheath along these, um, along these closed field, uh, along these open field lines. Uh, just to kind of illustrate this in terms of magnetic field lines, uh, for northward IMF, you get X lines that are poleward at the cusps, and MMS is sitting out here. The crossing MMS does at a magnetopause when the IMF was northward is virtually uh, 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 zero uh, shear angle, but it's connected uh, through reconnection to these two X lines in the northern and southern hemisphere. When you turn southward, of course, you produce this, uh, this long reconnection line, and this long reconnection line uh, is going to accelerate plasma, uh, uh, and MMS is going to observe it southward of the, of the spacecraft location. And, uh, and you see these signatures of reconnection. So uh, conclude here uh, and open up for questions. Uh, I got a couple slides here, but uh, the uh, oxygen in the dayside magnetosphere, it originates in the high latitude ionosphere where it was discovered in 1972. Uh, there are two populations, the ring current and the warm plasma cloak. Uh, when you have sustained IMF southward, uh, it injects oxygen into the tail, but convection uh, brings it back to the day side, and there are various uh, sinks uh, for this oxygen that is returning to the day side. Uh, one of which, uh, the one that I've focused on, is magnetic reconnection. And basically, if oxygen makes it to the magnetopause, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, either expelled out into the magnetosheath, 50% of it, uh, or uh, sent back down to the cusp and, and uh, probably out down tail uh, the other 50% of the population. Uh, sustained BZ North injects oxygen directly from the ionosphere into the low latitude boundary layer and we call this uh, mass loading of the low latitude boundary layer because it's a significant oxygen population that, uh, and because oxygen of course has a mass per charge 16, uh, it's, uh, it's 16 times, uh, it, it adds 16 times uh, the, to the uh, uh, mass density 
of the low latitude boundary layer compared to hydrogen. Questions in future work. Um, the ionospheric component of the ring current in a warm plasma cloak, it appears to be two different populations, uh, but are they really from two different sources uh, or the same source or just processed differently or both? Uh, I think that's, a, that's an open question and a, and a very interesting one uh, because it's clear that when you see the warm plasma cloak, you do not see any uh, solar wind uh, population in there. Whereas when you see the ring current, there is always a solar wind population uh, in included in the ring current. I've ignored the O plus and the plasma sphere and the plume. Uh, in the plasma sphere and the plume, the helium plus density is greater than the O plus density. And we can see this at the day side magnetopause. Uh, so it's not that I don't think it's there, uh, but I, what I've been doing is emphasizing uh, uh, oxygen in in, ox in oxygen dominant uh, uh, populations at the day side. Uh, how does the day side outer magnetosphere convection work? Uh, uh, how does the large temperature difference between the warm plasma cloak and the ring current come into play? Uh, does the warm plasma cloak and plume mix at R greater than 6.6 .6 RE? Don't know. Uh, uh, it's ripe for a study though. Uh, and the, finally, I would say that, you know, I've, I've avoided this discussion of the effects of reconnection by oxygen, uh, the oxygen effects on reconnection at the day side, uh, because that uh, in the MMS era, we have not found any truly large oxygen population near the day side magnetopause. The largest densities I've seen are one per cubic centimeter. That's pretty high uh, when you multiply that by 16. But, uh, but uh, typically that's compressed cases and the magnetosheath population, the mass density is much higher than that. Uh, and so we don't really know what, uh, what a, a truly large oxygen population will do to convection reconnection and, and what else uh, you're interested in. So I think that's it. Uh, and um, thank you very much for listening and uh, open for questions. Thank you, Siv. That was very clear and interesting talk. We do have some questions, so I'll go through them one by one. Uh, the first question comes from Lynn Wilson. Um, he wants to know, if the energy differences between H plus and O plus in the warm plasma cloak mass are proportional. Uh, so the, the last three words of that, I didn't catch. The energy differences? The energy differences between H plus and O plus in the warm plasma cloak mass are proportional. Oh, are proportional to mass. Uh, um, the that's an interesting question. Uh, I I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, it would be very interesting to to take the distribution function and calculate the temperature, the true temperature of the distribution function, and and see if it's proportional to mass. Uh, I would caution that you uh, that you do that uh, by by looking at the distribution function because they're both propagating at the same velocity. And so, and so, uh, so that part of the energy is truly proportional to mass, but whether the temperature is proportional to mass, uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. So the next question is on slide 11, if you could please go okay. back. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so this question comes from Jason there, and he says you indicate that there was little evidence of an Alvin layer. Couldn't it just be that the time scale for variation and location of the Alvin layer is much smaller than the convection time scale? This would yeah. cause apparent crossing of the Alvin layer, making it appear as though it isn't fixed on the time scale of interest. 
I I agree with that statement a hundred percent. And and I I I exercise. I said this caution here that this tracing of the ion convection. This is not the same as tracing the ion convection from the tail. That needs to be done. And uh, and and uh, going all the way to the outer to the to the magnetopause with this tracing has not been done. Uh, but I I really do feel that for the most part uh, that these this population down here uh, at, at near near the dusk especially near the dusk terminator are just times when the alphane layer is uh, is far over uh, or non-existent on the day side magnetopause. And so, yes, I, I agree with that uh, completely. Okay. So the next question is from William Lutuk, Lutko. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Oh, right. yes. Uh, <laughs> Lutko, uh, yes. Yes, so um, he says some theoretical studies, for example, Chaston et al, indicate that O plus can be energized at low altitude on field line threading the middle magnetosphere. Uh, comparisions with the uh, Vanal data. Might this uh, process explain why the spatial distribution of the warm plasma cloak doesn't necessarily follow convection streamlines from the tail? Uh, it could, and uh, I am not as familiar with that uh, that sort of study, and I obviously have to take take a look at it uh, because um, when when we look when we look at the convection in in the inner magnetosphere, uh, uh, when we do uh, detailed studies of this convection, like is shown here. Um, it, it it seems to agree with a with a night side source, even relatively close to the Earth. Uh, but but that does not rule out the possibility that that uh, you could have uh, you could have a, a transient effect of of uh, a uh, convection out of the middle uh, uh, latitude ionosphere. Uh, filling the, uh, the, the inner magnetosphere. Um, but, but the field lines, so, so uh, that's another reason why I actually kind of carefully uh, uh, stuck with outer magnetosphere and magnetopause because I, uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to avoid this issue that, uh, or, or use the simplification that field lines from the high latitude ionosphere mapped to the day side magnetopause. So, uh, so this is entirely possible and, uh, and uh, uh, is the subject of future work, I think. Okay. So the next question is from Li Jin Chen. And he wants to know if O plus ions of hundreds of KV have been observed or upstream at that. Well, actually, it says um, O plus ions of hundreds of kV have been observed far upstream at L1. For example, uh, Eric Posner. Uh, could you comment on the current understanding regarding how this could happen? So that is that that is an interesting <laughs> and an interesting population uh, because. It, they they essentially the gyro radii of a uh, hundred kilovolt oxygen is is huge, uh, and uh, and so uh, I, I would say that more than likely uh, it is it is escaping out of uh, out of um, out of an open magnetopause uh, a magnetopause that's go undergoing reconnection, but uh, but. For those, for that population, uh, the the uh, the gyro radius, so gyro radii effects, are going to be clearly uh, as important as uh, as uh, just simple uh, convection along open field lines. Uh, so, I, I yeah, I, I 
that's way out of my energy range. <laughs> And uh, and and so, uh, but but my argument that you know the day side is pretty much open all the time for southward IMF uh, uh, still stands, and so those those oxygen ions are certainly aided by the fact that uh, the magnetopause is open. Okay, so we have one final question, and that comes from Steve Milan. He wants to know over what range of IMF clock angle. Do you believe dual lobe reconnection occurs? Um, I I would say that uh, that that is uh, dual lobe reconnection. I think occurs uh, from clock angles from about uh, zero uh, to um, roughly uh, uh, forty-five to fifty degrees. Uh, uh, or either side, of course, of of of, uh, of noon. So um, so clock angles of fifty degrees, uh, and and when you get beyond that, you start uh, you start creating uh, you start creating an X line that that cuts across uh, the day side magnetopause. Uh, this is very hard to investigate because. Uh, um, because the IMF is rarely steady uh, at a you know given orientation uh, for for a long period of time, and uh, it really takes sorting through a lot, thousands of magnetopause crossings to try to find a a, a sample set that that you can do, uh, that you can use. But I, I think the uh, the numbers that the, the number that I would be comfortable with is dual lobe reconnection occurring uh, between zero and and fifty degrees uh, uh, clock angle, and uh, yeah, that's that's it. Okay, thank you, thank you again for the great talk. It was very clear, very interesting, and thank you everyone for the questions and also the comments that I did not mention. Uh, please have a look in the chat uh, section. Um, also, I would like to thank you all for joining again. Uh, please join us again next Monday. We will have two talks. Uh, the first talk is at an uh, earlier time than usual. It will be given by Benoit Lavoud. Uh, he will discuss the cusps at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and then at 12 p.m., we have a shorter talk by El Sayed Talat. Uh, he will give an overview of the space weather follow-on mission. So please don't forget and join us next week. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening in.